This is my favorite photograph of the Wright brothers. Wilbur at the left, Orville with a mustache. They gave to mankind a magnificent new vehicle for flying into the air. But here is a down-to-earth picture of the two of them sitting on the back porch of their home in Dayton, Ohio. How do you do again? I'm Paul Garber, historian emeritus and Ramsey associate of the National Air and Space Museum in Washington. In this part of our story, part four on the section of the Wright brothers, we have come to that time when, although the Wright brothers in 1903 had invented the airplane, in 1904, five, six, seven, and eight had improved it, and in 1909 were still ahead of most others. By 1910, others in the world had developed airplanes, some of them very interesting, very efficient, such as this Antoinette airplane with Hubert Latham, its principal pilot. In this part of our story, we will be telling not only what the Wright brothers themselves were doing, but also what was accomplished by persons whom they had taught to fly and others who were flying the Wright type of airplane. The great prize for airplane speed in 1910 was the James Gordon Bennett Trophy, which had been won for America in 1909 by Glenn Curtis, thus making America the host for 1910. As I concluded part three of our story, I showed you this Wright Racer, which had been designed and built especially to keep this prize in America. It was named the Baby Grand, Orville, here at the controls, had flown it at a speed of almost 70 miles per hour, faster than the known speed of any other entry. Its eight-cylinder engine weighed about 300 pounds, 100 pounds more than their usual four-cylinder types, and developed over 50 horsepower. Now look at the size of those propellers. I think they must be around 10 feet in diameter. The wingspan was only 22 feet almost half that of the Kitty Hawk Flyer. Here's a final engine test. Now, there were no brakes in those days, and they hadn't used wheel chocks yet. I remember back in the old early bird times, it was customary for someone to, haul, to holler, more beef, and everyone would run to give a hand, and here you see they're holding it back so that the engine can be tried out. Also, sometimes we used to fasten a spring balance to the tail and then tie that to a post so we could measure the pull. Walter Brookins, the first person taught to fly by the Wright brothers, was to pilot the Baby Grand in this race. But to the great disappointment of many, particularly Wilbur and Orville, the engine up there at Belmont Park cut out at the critical time, and Brookins smashed into a bad landing. He crawled out of the wreck, but America's best hopes to win the race were lost. The English flyer, Claude Graham White, flying a 100-horsepower French Bleriot monoplane, won at a speed of 61 miles per hour. There were a total of nine entrants from three nations, America, England, and France. Arch Hoxie, also flying a small span Wright airplane, but with a 30 horsepower engine, attained an altitude of about 7,000 feet at Belmont on October 27. On that day, the wind was so strong that his flyer and that of Ralph Johnston were blown backward while still facing forward. On the last day of the meet, October 31, Johnston established a world altitude record of 9,714 feet. Another famous air meet during the fall of 1910 was held at St. Louis. There, Arch Hoxie took Theodore Roosevelt for a flight. He was the first person who had been president of the United States to fly in an airplane. As they landed and Teddy put back his, white, his wide-brimmed felt hat, <laughs> he probably said, that was bully. Air Express was inaugurated on November 7, 1910, when Phil Parmalee flew a Wright airplane from Sims Station near Dayton to Columbus, Ohio, carrying a package of silk consigned to the Moorehouse Martins Company. The cargo weighed about 100 pounds and was valued at $800. His flight clothing consisted of an undershirt, a sweater, 
a sweater coat, a heavy top coat, woolen cap, and goggles. The 65-mile flight was made in 66 minutes. Parmony carried one piece of air mail. And the crowd that welcomed, they were so amused because he had such a hard time getting through all of this clothing and, and finally finding that letter to give it to Max Morehouse. Now, also in 1910, the world had become greatly interested in aviation. And everyone in America, among other nations, wanted to see airplanes in flight. So the Wright brothers organized an exhibition team. The uh, person there with a the derby hat, we used to call it an iron hat, is Roy Nobinshoe, famous balloonist and dirigible airship pilot. He headed up the team, and Parmalee, we just met, he's there at the left. There's Walter Brookins at the right. There were many persons in that team. Now, Frank uh, Coffin was another member of that team. There he is with Wilbur, Wilbur being at the right, another iron hat. Frank was a very capable pilot, but also there at the Wright School in Dayton, he was in charge of instruction. He's given to the museum the sheets that were used at that time to tabulate the accomplishments of the pilots. I hope we can raise this picture a bit and see those high button shoes. Those are a classic thing of those days. I remember how proud I was of mine. It took me quite a while to button them up with my mother's old fashioned button hook. Well, Frank was a splendid person and was one of the first to use floats on a Wright Type B airplane. This remarkable picture was taken in February of 1912. He was flying at New York, and he would have to somehow, you see that tugboat has made a path through the ice. He took off by dodging these cakes of ice and flew over part of the city and also flew over the, over the Statue of Liberty, taking some photographs of it at the time. Another pilot of Wright-type planes was George Gray, who made numerous exhibition flights in the Middle Atlantic states, particularly in Virginia. Later, when he was a pilot in World War I, he was so very proud of this license in which he could show that he'd learned to fly on Wright Brothers airplanes. I knew most of these men. I value my friendship with them. I wish I could tell more about the wonderful early bird friends that I have. There's an organization, you know, of the old timers, early birds. It was my privilege to be the recent president of it. Now, there were some girls who learned to fly, also of the Wright planes. There's Catherine Stinson, standing with her Wright plane. She learned to fly at Chicago and was taught to fly by Max Lilly. She thrilled many crowds in those cities over which she flew. Her sister, Marjorie, was also famous. They taught their brother, Eddie Stinson, to fly. Another brother, Jack, was also a pilot and maintained a flight school on Long Island. During World War I, Marjorie trained many Canadian pilots who fought in that war. Ruth Law was another girl flyer who learned the right system of control. Her cross-country flight in 1918 from Chicago to New York was a record maker. And during the First World War, she encouraged bond sales by advertising them from the sky. Now, Al Welsh, shown here at the left, had been one of the first three students taught to fly by Orville Wright. The other two were Brookins and Hoxie. Welsh's most famous pupil is shown here, Lieutenant Henry H. Arnold, later General of the Air Force. I always bow a bit to Hap. It was through him that I met my dear wife. And we always go over to his grave on Memorial Day and lay a few flowers there in appreciation. We're certainly a happy couple, and I'm so grateful to say so. Now, Hap had begun his lessons on May 3rd, 1911. The flight lasted seven minutes, and on the report sheet, Welch wrote, rough. <laughs> Some bad landings, I guess. The third lesson was for 12 minutes, and the comment was, hand on elevator, meaning that the teacher let the pupil steer the airplane up and down. During lesson number nine, Arnold was permitted to try balancing the airplane, and on lesson number 19, the comment was, landed without assistance. The final notation was number of flights, 28. Total time in the air, 3 hours, 43 minutes. Finished 13 May, 10 days learning. Actually, it was 11 days, but the Wright brothers didn't permit any flying on Sunday. They were the sons of Bishop Wright, you recall. Arnold's companion in training was Lieutenant Tommy Milling. 
Now there's Hap at the left and Tommy seated there in the airplane. Milling's teacher was Cliff Turpin. Here's Cliff in his airplane at the center of this group. The picture was taken when the minister at the right was marrying the couple at the left. Then Turpin took the bridal couple up for a short aerial honeymoon. There were all kinds of aviation thrills and stunts in those pioneer days. In June of 1911, the Army established its first aviation field at College Park, Maryland, the same field where Wilbur had taught the Army's first two pilots in 1909, as I described in my previous section of this series. There, the Army quartermaster con constructed these hangars, which had been designed by the Wrights, and Arnold, Milling, and other officers, pilots, and men were assigned to conduct military flight operations there. Arnold was a very active pilot. On July 7, he made an altitude flight of 3,260 feet. On July 10, he flew over the United States Capitol building. On July 18, he climbed to 4,167 feet. And on August 21, he made a cross-country flight of 42 miles to Frederick, Maryland. By this time, an increase of appropriations for aeronautics to $125,000 for the fiscal year 1912 had permitted the purchase of several airplanes of both the Wright and Curtis types. Bomb dropping in those days was a simple procedure. You just picked it up, held it out, and let it go. Here at San Francisco in 1910, Lieutenant Myron Chrissy had assembled a bomb from some two and a half inch pipe and made another one from an artillery shell. With Phil Parmley as pilot, Chrissy dropped them from a the Wright airplane over the Tanferan racetrack. These were the first live aerial bombs. But at College Park, a more scientific method was developed by Lieutenant Riley Scott. His invention carried two 18-pound bombs and included a telescope for measuring speed, an altimeter for measuring height, a stopwatch for precise timing, and tabulations for figuring equations. These tables were prepared for an altitude of 400 feet. And from that height, the bombs landed within 10 feet of a target that was four by five feet on the ground. Scott, whose pilots for these tests had been Tommy Milling, prepared tabulations for an altitude of 3,000 feet. But before he could make those tests at College Park, he had to leave for France. Our own War Department had not shown much interest, but the French had offered a prize for bomb dropping, and Scott was going to try to win it. In fact, there he did win the recognition he deserved. Now, James Means, of Boston, whom you'll recall from a previous talk, was compiler of the Aeronautical Annuals of 1895, 6, and 7. The Wright brothers had studied those and had continued their interest in aviation from that time. Means also was interested in aviation and in 1909 was granted a patent for a signaling device. It used the exhaust of the engine to blow through a tube in which lamp black was inserted by tapping a key something like a telegraph, whereby dots and dashes of the Morse code could be blown out as visual signals. This was also tested at College Park, October 13, 1911. The official report was, because of the short time of the visibility of the puffs and the impossibility of distinguishing the same at a distance greater than four or five miles, it is thought that the device is not practical for general military use. On June 7, 1912, Captain Chandler, who was in charge of the air station at College Park, tested a Lewis machine gun for the first time from the air. Lieutenant Milling was his pilot. Using a drum with 50 cartridges firing at the rate of 500 shots a minute, five hits were made on a strip of cheesecloth six by seven feet in size from an altitude of 250 feet. Other shots were fired into a pond to give the gunner a better idea of the spacing of the bullets. The next day, from an altitude of 550 feet, some 44 shots were fired. 14 of them hit a cloth target on the ground. The target was two yards by 18 yards in size. The gunner was handicapped by the lack of sights on his gun. And also, it was very difficult to maneuver, to aim, to turn the gun because of the limited connection there of it. Moreover, the War Department was not particularly impressed by this. They said the purpose of the airplane is for reconnaissance duty only, and it is those young officers out at College Park who have these 
rather ridiculous and fanciful ideas that gunnery would ever be used during air combats. You see, the War Department still had to learn a few things. In October of 1911, Orville Wright went back to Kitty Hawk to conduct some tests in gliding under the very favorable conditions that prevail there. He was anxious particularly to develop some kind of an automatic stabilizer. In fact, he'd been working on that since 1907. He had with him there at Kitty Hawk his brother, Lauren, his nephew, Horace, and their friend, Alec Ogilvy of England. Their first job upon arrival at the old camp was to patch up the hangar and arrange housekeeping details. The gliding tests continued for most of the month with various modifications made in the aircraft, at times using some parts from the old machine of 1905, which they had left there. The most notable performance was on October 24, when about 20 glides were made, ranging from one minute to a world record of nine minutes and 45 seconds. Now that's hovering, you see, remaining motionless, pretty much motionless over one spot. Marvelous accomplishment. This record was not exceeded until 1921, when Germany, you see, had been prevented from flying powered aircraft and then turned to gliding to keep up their flying proficiency. And then they did finally surpass that nine minute record. But this stood for about 10 years. Also in October 1911, another air meet was being held in St. Louis. One of the features was the carrying of mail by airplane. Walter Brookins, here seated on the skid, was the pilot. This was the second instance of official airplane mail in America. The first had occurred the previous month at the Nassau Boulevard Long Island air meet when Earl Ovington, wearing the crash helmet, had received the bag of mail from the postmaster general himself, Frank Hitchcock, the Postmaster General gave me this picture several years ago. Now at St. Louis, second assistant postmaster general, Granfield officiated. He's the gray-haired gentleman. The date of October 4 is confirmed by this piece of mail addressed to A.B. Lambert, one of the most enthusiastic patrons of aviation in those pioneer days. Later became one of the St. Louis sponsors of Charles Lindbergh's transatlantic flight. Incidentally, there's a penny postcard. You don't see them anymore. Now here's Mr. Lambert with Walter Brookins. One of the most notable pilots of Wright airplanes on cross-country flights was Harry Atwood. His world record accomplishment for 1911 was from St. Louis to New York City, a distance of 1,266 miles made with 19 intermediate stops in 12 days. A Wright Type B made by the Burgess Company under license was used and required no major repairs en route. It was the same airplane he had used in a flight from Boston to Atlantic City, New Jersey. Soon after that flight, Atwood learned that the Aero Club of Washington had awarded him its gold medal. The Aero Club of America also recognized that flight. The medal was to be presented by the President of the United States, then William Howard Taft. To receive it, Atwood flew to Washington and landed on the southern lawn of the White House, believe it or not. When I told one of our president's helicopter pilots about this flight and this landing, the helicopter pilot refused to believe it until I showed him this picture. He thought only helicopters could sit down in the backyard of the White House. Then when I said that Atwood took off from the same limited space after receiving the medal, as verified by this photograph, the president's pilot finally gave in, but he pointed out that the trees were not as tall then as they are now but the greatest flight of 1911. And in fact, one of the most notable of all time was accomplished by this pilot, Calbraith Perry Rogers. He loved to fly and he loved a cigar too. He not only exceeded Atwood's distance record, but became the first person to fly an airplane all the way from coast to coast across the United States of America. Rogers was the descendant of famous Americans. His father was a captain in the United States Army and fought in the Indian Wars. Roger's great-grandfather was Commodore Matthew Calbraith Perry, who had sailed his squadron into Japanese waters, inviting that nation to engage in commerce with America back in the 1860s. Roger's granduncle was Captain Oliver Hazard Perry, hero of the Battle of Lake Erie in the War of 1812. Cal had hoped to be a naval officer, but was prevented by an air condition. Becoming interested in aviation when he visited his cousin, John Rogers of the Navy, while that officer was detailed to the Wright School for flight instruction, Cal decided to also take lessons. He soloed in the remarkable time of 90 minutes instruction. He attracted national attention two months later 
during the nine-day air meet held in Chicago when he won the award for the most time in the air, flying every day for a total of 27 hours. Now, back in those romantic days of the early birds, there were various prizes offered for flights from one city to another. Remember that Curtis got the one from Albany to New York, and then Hamilton got the one from New York to Philadelphia in return. But then William Randolph Hearst of the Hearst newspapers was going to clobber all those lesser prizes of around five and $10,000 with a $50,000 prize. Now, $50,000 was a heck of a lot of money then. It still is to a museum curator, I assure you. But $50,000 for the first flight from coast to coast, all the way in either direction. It had to be done, however, in 30 days. Now, Cal Rogers was among those who were determined to win that prize. The others, oh, they cracked up or gave up, but he kept on. He took off from Sheep's Head Bay, Long Island, on 17 December, 17 September, from Sheep's Head Bay, Long Island. His airplane was a right type EX, single-seated with a 35-horsepower four-cylinder engine. He flew right over New York City. Now, can you imagine sitting on a board seat, no safety belt, your feet stick out on a little piece of about two by two, or less than that, wood, to brace your feet on. You look down at all those skyscrapers reaching up at you. He flew right over New York City, but then he spotted on the New Jersey tracks this white painted car. Now, that says Vin Fizz. Vin Fizz was a drink, now not Gin Fizz, Vin Fizz was a drink sold for five cents, put out by the Armour Company, who were meat packers, so I don't know what they put in the drink. They said it had grapes in it. But they were paying part of his expenses, five dollars a mile. And this was one of a train of cars. This had his spare parts in it, had another airplane, had a spare engine. His wife was in there. I didn't mean to say she was a spare part. No, she rode in the Pullman car. It was also a diner. There was this train that accompanied him. And sometimes he'd catch up to the train, sometimes the train would catch up to him. Now here is Cal landing at Middletown, New York. That was his first stop, a wonderful flight. He said it was a good landing because it didn't knock the ashes off the end of his cigar. He'd flown 84 miles in 105 minutes. Now here he holds up his only instrument. That's a piece of string. It was a corset string, his wife donated that. But that was fastened to a wire in front of him and it would wave at him. And if it waved to right or left, he knew that he was drifting side to side. If it waved up or down, he knew that he was climbing or descending. It's a very good instrument, but that's all he had. No compass at all. Nothing but that little piece of line. Now, taking off from Middletown the next morning, his wheels brushed the top of a tree and he landed in a chicken yard. That's no place to set it down. Repairs took three days. He had, you must realize, he had no advanced weather reports, no compass, no accurate information about the route ahead, only the railroad tracks to guide him. And sometimes he took the wrong switch. He flew on. His route lay across New York State, a corner of Pennsylvania, into Ohio, Indiana, Chicago. Then he turned southward because he knew he couldn't get over the high Rockies, through Missouri, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas. He had more than a dozen serious crack-ups, some real washouts. But with the help of his mechanics, he, he kept on. Charlie Taylor was sometimes sent to help him from the Wright Company there in Dayton. As he got to Texas, there was an eagle there that disputed Cal's right to invade those skies. Also in Texas, he met Bob Fowler, who was trying to win the Hearst Prize by flying from California to the East Coast. Fowler eventually reached the Florida coast near Jacksonville. That was the next year. It took him 122 days. As I stand here, the record is 123 minutes. Same distance, a B-58. But now we're back in 1911. After 49 days, Rogers arrived at his official destination. That was Pasadena, California. Here he received enthusiastic acclaim, as you can see. He had exceeded the 30-day stipulation, so he didn't get the prize. Nobody got the prize. Sort of a dirty trick, I think. But he did get the American flag around his shoulders. And that's a good enough prize for anybody. But now he wanted to take off and actually reach the Pacific coast. Here he is. He's going to go about 15 miles onto Long Beach. But over Compton, his engine quit, and he really pranged it down. He landed head first in a plowed field. Both legs were broken, also his collarbone, and he had a brain concussion, was unconscious for 24 hours. He was in the hospital a month. But then with his good wife's help, now that's Mabel at the left, 
His mother has on that rather large hat. But then they got him out in a wheelchair. He got on board a pair of crutches. He hobbled over to his beloved Vin Fizz, which had been repaired by his faithful crew. An enormous crowd awaited him at Long Beach. And there, sure enough, he landed and rolled those wheels in the surf of the Pacific. This was a glorious moment. He had flown from coast to coast in 84 days, a distance of 4,320 miles the way he flew it. The first person to cross the United States of America by air. He was fated back and forth, banquets on the East Coast, the West Coast. But finally, he returned to California. And then on April 3rd, he was giving an exhibition flight over Long Beach in his right B. He flew over a pier. And there was a bunch of seagulls that rose up rather frightened. One of them jammed itself into the controls. And down went Cal. He did not walk away from this one. He died April 3, 1912. Today, in the National Air and Space Museum, in this old tin shed, and I'll put in a plug for a new building because this is the most permanent temporary building in Washington, there is the Vin Fizz Flyer, restored by the Smithsonian crew, a wonder to everyone who sees it, this marvelous aircraft that did make the first coast-to-coast -coast flight. Another development in 1911 is especially pertinent to this series of talks that we're giving. There's the Navy's first air station. And there is the Wright Type B there at Greenbury Point, Maryland, across the Severn River from Annapolis. Lieutenant Rogers, who was Cal Rogers' cousin, had been taught to fly at the Wright Brothers School and was sent there to fly the plane. There's John Rogers in the foreground. With the showing of this picture, I want to identify and thank the sailor in the white cap. He is Dale Ziegler, by whose kindness I obtained these pictures of the B-1. I'll speak about him further in our next program. The B-1 was operated either as a land plane or a sea plane. Here is one configuration with two floats. And here, one float only is used with the addition of wingtip floats to keep it balanced in rough water. Flights were made in the B-1 to Baltimore and to other areas of the Chesapeake. And then in December, with wintry weather making flying difficult, the aviators at Greenbury Point were ordered to transfer with their equipment to North Island, San Diego, California. There the dear old B-1 finally was washed out. Here is how a naval aviator kept his feet dry when going ashore from his aircraft riding piggyback on some sailor. The dear old B-1, as I said, was finally washed out after about two years of service but we're so grateful that one piece of it has been preserved, and that's the engine that you see here on this model. I'll tell you about that in our next program. I think it's a wonderful story, thanks to the foresight of the Navy, thanks a bit to the museum. We have kept it, and it's a wonderful part, the oldest relic of naval aviation. <laughs>